really look forward to your feedback. I'm used to presenting to a business uh, management crowd, so I'm very excited to hear um, you know, what you all think of this ongoing work um, because it does deal with actually a lot of non-business uh, theories and data. So um, uh, very happy to be presenting um, with the Institute on Ecosystems. So um, this is a paper that I'll present, um, but it's part of a larger piece of work. Um, it is still a working paper. Um, and so, yeah, feedback at this time is, uh, is appreciated as we wrap it up and finalize it for submission to a journal. Um, and so this paper's working title is Enabling Organizational Sustainability, a Social Ecological Systems Perspective on Voluntary Standards Programs. I will define each of those terms. I know <laughs> the title is also a work in progress, um, but uh, this is work that emanates actually from my dissertation um, and um, with my advisor, Jennifer Howard Grenville, who's, uh, I was at University of Oregon with her and she is now at University of Cambridge. Um, so we have had a couple of papers published um, uh, from this work. And um, this is one was empirical and uh, on the topic of environmental certifications and voluntary standards. And um, then a conceptual paper actually on um, more like how we should use a, a lens, the social ecological systems lens in business. So actually I'll go back to the title page. This is the empirical paper where we take uh, the bulk of our data and actually put those two concepts together. And um, so organizational sustainability, I'll just start there. This is a big term and a lot of people question what it really means. And I'll actually define it through what prior literature how prior literature in my field defines it. Um, I am an organizational management scholar um, and I do research sustainable business. So um, we have a few theories that we've developed to decide to define what sustainability is for businesses. Um, and I'll use business and organizations interchangeably. The idea is that businesses indicate a for-profit enterprise and organizations are, are more broad than that. Um, and the reason we use organizational sustain sustainability is that we're looking for at it from the management side, from the practice side, and whether you're in a nonprofit or a for-profit or a, a, you know, whatever type of organization, um, you have management and practices. Um, so just some terminology there. Um, so one of the things that is one of our biggest obstacles in looking at organizational sustainability is that all of our theories to date assume a controllable environment. So we have adaptation theories suggesting co-evolution strategies. So, you know, organizations should adapt their practices um, and hey, also why not structure their environment in a way that helps them uh, be more competitive, be more effective, whatever it is. Um, that doesn't work as well when you're talking about the environment being nature. Um, sustainability theories more specifically suggest that organizations need to balance environment um, and environmental and societal impacts with economic success. So even today, um, Elkington, the uh, citation here, he introduced the idea of the triple bottom line um, 20 years ago now. And that just you can't balance the environment, society, and profit um, in practice. Profit always wins. So that just, it, it's a good idea, but it, it's not really the most effective in practice. But that's kind of where we still are in the business field. Um, profit is still what uh, people want to maximize. So um, we do have some cool research moving in the way of looking at sustainability as resilience. Um, but that all that work in that area um, in the empirical work in that area has looked at it as bouncing back from a crisis or disruption, not really um, being resilient in the way that ecologists think about resilience, um, you know, changing in relation to dynamic environments. So um, there's a hurricane, a supply chain is disrupted. How does a, an organization bounce back to what it was? 
uh, before that disruption. So um, moving in good directions, but still our current state of thought in the management field on sustainability is really limited at this point. Um, and we uh, argue that we need to look through the lens of social ecological systems. Um, that would enable us to um, engage systems-based responses for systems-based problems because um, sustainability really is, you know, we could think of analogs as organizations operating in ways that, um, you know, preserve benefits for future generations, um, or we can think about it as combating climate change. Um, we can think about it as, um, you know, being responsible to society and the environment. Um, and this is why I didn't start by defining organizational sustainability because it's so many things. But the basic idea is that it's very complex. And um, so we need complex responses to complex problems. And so part of this is these, we do have some work suggesting that these solutions should be engaged coordinated action. Um, and I'll, I'll turn to that um, in a minute. But first, just to emphasize what, what do I mean by a social ecological system and how do businesses fit in is um, it invites us to think about instead of balancing economic, environmental and social benefit um, or value, um, it just says, you know what, businesses are on planet Earth, they are embedded on planet Earth, uh, we cannot control natural systems, so we need to work within natural systems and we need to redesign business models, business practices, products, and services to fit within natural systems. Um, and so the idea is that people use nature for their benefit. Uh, nature provides us with material and immaterial benefits. We can think eco ecosystem services as a way to think about that. Um, and so how do we close that loop and work within nature? A social ecological systems lens also allows us to think about temporal dynamics. And this is really important um, in the organizational scholarship because um, for-profit business-related research has really emphasized short-term thinking. Um, and so not only inviting long-term thinking, but it, the dynamics that happen across a range of temporal um, periods. And then it also importantly invites um, a perspective on scale. So businesses operate in localized places, but their practices can have effects at um, broader scales. And then many companies operating in many local places all have effects on broader scale processes um, in society and in nature. So a social ecological systems lens just allows us to um, make our thinking more complex, which is always fun, but hard to do, which is um, one reason why we um, we're just dipping our toe in this, um, this line of thinking. So we do have a little bit of work on systems-based organizational sustainability. And um, this is the work that it's a very, a lot of it is conceptual, so not a lot of data to back it up, but that, you know, just kind of introducing this idea that we should be studying this. And it talks about coordinated, coordinated action being the most important. And a lot of our work to date has talked about collective action and the shorthand difference between the two is that collective action is the call for many organizations to all contribute to sustainability in whatever way they want. But you can imagine that that's a lot less effective um, if we use the example of climate change, um, you know, we have a Patagonia and we have a Nike and we have, you know, all the other companies out there that are acting on sustainability, but doing it in their own way and on their own timelines and to whatever extent they want. And coordinated action um, means that, means, you know, we have climate change, we start there and we actually um, go the other direction and divvy out what, does in, what do individual organizations all need to be doing in tandem, intentionally together, with an understanding of how natural systems work um, to, to actually be more effective and impactful. Companies are already experiencing the effects of climate change. They are going to be facing inc increasing stresses posed by other biophysical changes, planetary systems like biodiversity loss. Um, they affect the well-being of societies, which are companies, employees, and customers. Um, you know, all of these things are not as obvious 
to let's say a shoe manufacturer operating in Oregon, um, but they will become, the ripple effects of those changes um, are here and affecting supply chains and affecting um, you know, consumer well-being, regulator pressures, et cetera. So this is, it's really vital. I mean, you know, even beyond just climate change is, is a big bad uh, beast, but um, the viability of companies will be threatened as well. Um, and ecologists, we do have um, quite a bit of literature in another field um, outside of business that has accounted for interconnectedness between biophysical and social processes, whereas organi organizational theories do not account for those kinds of dynamics. Um, particularly including spatiotemporal scale processes. So we, um, we are going to draw on that in our research. Um, and before we dive in, um, I will be examining voluntary standards programs as a tool to coordinate action among organizations on sustainability. So I just want to briefly introduce what those are. You might also know them as um, certification programs or environmental management systems. Um, there is not a lot of work out there that directly looks at voluntary standards programs as a tool to coordinate action. But, you know, if you connect the dots, if you've read enough literature, um, and, you know, I introduced this talk by saying that I did my dissertation in this area, so I read, you know, a lot of literature. Um, there's not a lot of work out there that actually directly looks at voluntary standards programs as this kind of tool. but but when you read enough work, you kind of think hmm, maybe maybe there's um, this potential. So what is a VSP before I get too ahead of myself? Um, you can think about environmental standards, um, eco labels, certifications, lots of programs will come to mind. Um, the idea here is it is voluntary. These are also called voluntary regulations because they're supposed to be um, an analog for regulations to motivate uh, companies to comply with uh, base levels of environmental um, management. So uh, another key, key feature is they usually involve regular audits. So every three to five years, some certifications will even, um, or BSPs will even do it every year, but more, more of them are, are two to five years. They do require payment of fees. Um, and these audits are conducted usually by the VSP organization, the body that is uh, setting the standards, um, or in some cases, they're audited by an outside third party. Um, but they are audited. And then just some very common uh, VSPs that you may be aware of are uh, USDA Organic, um, ISO 14001, the Rainforest Alliance, uh, Certified B Corp, and Forest Stewardship Council. So those are just to put them in more concrete terms. So yes, so we see that there's this potential to coordinate action on sustainability across dispersed organizations. Um, and we say dispersed as in geographically dispersed. So here's the other problem though on the other side here is that most none of the work really talks about um, VSPs as tools in this way. Really look, all the, the current research to date has really just focused on how can organizations use let's say an eco label to you know be more effective um, in the marketplace so the strategic dimension so um, i'm going to be able to charge more for my product because i have this eco label and customers will pay that premium for that eco label um, or i'm going to adopt a certification so that i can um, you know look better than my closest competitor um, Symbolic dimensions are, are studied um, quite a bit as well. That's to say, you know, look, a third party said that we're being um, environmentally friendly. Isn't that great? Consumers, regulators, you know, whoever else. Um, but symbolic is the key word there. Um, not a little bit of work, I should say. Some work suggests that voluntary standards um, can go beyond these more symbolic uh, mechanisms to actually have an impact on practice. Um, there's some disappointing work, I'll use that word, um, that says that you know, a lot of companies will adopt a certification program, a, volunteer, a VSP, um, engage in the minimum amount of work needed to get that eco-label just because they want to be able to say to consumers, 
um, yes, we're eco-friendly, please pay more for our product. Um, but we do have some work that's starting to shift from that focus to looking at how these VSPs can actually coordinate action um, in, in the organization. So the more like upstream impacts um, rather than the downstream consumer impacts um, and revenue impacts. Um, but again, this work is just, it's suggestive. So, um, but we think that, you know, there's a possibility. And then we, we return to the ecology literature, which talks about the idea of bridging organizations. And we kind of, we see a corollary um, that, you know, hmm, this, this could be the way in which VSPs could be this tool to coordinate action. Um, and I should say that it's not that VSPs are not engaging um, in motivating substantive action on sustainability in organizations. It's just that um, management scholars, business scholars have not focused their attention on that capacity. So um, we're hope, you know, we have a case example that we're studying um, and we see quite a bit of potential for other VSPs to um, add this in or, or emphasize that they're already doing it and to emphasize it. So we just lack an understanding of how they can actually do this. Um, and so our, our motivating research question is how can VSPs enact a bridging organization to coordinate action on sustainability among uh, geographically dispersed organizations? And this bridging capacity um, in a nutshell really means you know, for-profit organizations, businesses are operating on typically privately owned uh, land and they have privately owned resources and they're operating at a very narrow spatial and short temporal scale. And we're gonna be studying vineyards. So I included a picture of um, narrow scale um, vineyard management. Um, the VSP can coordinate action at a broader level um, and then manage how organizations at the local level implement. And so that's what we're going to unpack in this study. So we looked at LIVE, um, which stands for Low Input Viticulture and Enology. It is in the Pacific Northwest wine industry, um, and that includes Oregon and Washington for the purposes of this study. Uh, LIVE is also, uh, I think it has about six vineyards in Idaho, and it's um, expanding into British Columbia now. But we just studied Oregon and Washington um, at, at the time of our study. That's where LIVE was. Um, if you're familiar with the term integrated pest management, IPM, uh, this certification was founded on those principles. And um, it was established in 1997 in Oregon by vineyard managers and farmers. And they were unhappy with um, the effectiveness of the organic or biodynamic programs. And that's what were the two other most popular um, sustainable agricultural certifications in the area. And um, so they decided to start their own program with the intent that it would help uh, coordinate sustainability throughout the region uh, more effectively and more uh, tailored to actually vineyard um, operations. So they then expanded to Washington State in 2006 and shortly after formally split into two regions, which I'll uh, talk about when I talk about the data. And um, at the end of our study in 2017, um, there were about 280 individual members throughout the two states. So um, this region, the whole area, has about 2,500 vineyard firms, and it includes two distinct topographical and climatic uh, regions. So Western Oregon, most of the wine in Oregon is grown in the Willamette Valley, which is the brown area there on the left in that blue box. Um, and there is some wine grown up around um, the Puget Sound. And so Western Oregon and Washington uh, wetter, it's colder, it's hillier. Um, and then where most of the wine is grown in Washington state is on the Eastern side of the state. Um, and fun fact, Washington state is the second largest uh, wine producing region in the country. Oregon is the third, uh, of course, California is the first. So these are um, highly productive uh, regions and economic drivers for their states. Um, but in Eastern Washington and actually Southern Oregon as well, um, the Rogue Valley is included and in, I think the Umpqua Valley as well, but the Rogue Valley has more similar uh, climate characteristics as um, Eastern Washington. That's hotter, drier and flatter. 
And so later I'll, I'll talk about live region one and region two. Um, and live region one, uh, you can see that's Mount Hood in the background and um, it's the Willamette Valley is very hilly. It's, um, you know, very wet, uh, very humid, a lot of moisture, um, mainly from rainfall. Um, and con contrasted with Eastern Washington, which is on the bottom there, um, a lot drier, flatter, you have um, huge industrial farms, um, but also uh, irrigation pressures. So I'll uh, talk about the importance of these differences uh, in just a minute. So the methods and data for this study, it is a longitudinal uh, study. And um, we looked at 215 archival documents, and this was the standards themselves. So we had the standards documents from 2007 to 2016. Uh, the actual, you know, what did members of this certification have to do to be able to, you know, earn that stamp every year to pass their audit um, in their vineyard management practices. We also had board meeting minutes from the year that the organization was established in 1999 through the entirety of the study. So looking at the decisions that the board was making um, at pretty regular intervals, they had very, um, very good board meeting minutes, I have to say, um, a pleasure to read and also um, a lot of great data. And then various other documents that LIVE published, um, including blogs, newsletters, actually web pages from um, across the period of our study. And then I'll, I'll explain what special protocols are, are in a minute. Also, I should have put in here annual reports. Um, I attended three conferences. So I went to a Washington wine industry conference, an Oregon wine industry conference, and then a live annual meeting as part of the study. And I conducted 47, 46 in-depth interviews. And that was um, with current and past uh, previous live uh, board members and also uh, various vineyard managers, vineyard owners, actually, and also winery owner and managers. And so this was a qualitative, uh, it is a qualitative case study analysis. Um, and this is the short version um, of how we engaged in the analysis, but um, through many, many, many times reading these documents and interview transcripts and talking to people, um, we realized that live, uh, the standards changed quite drastically over time. Um, and as I'll show you in a minute, we found out that there were about four stages in the way that the standards evolved. Um, we also learned quickly that at the, you know, at the time that, that we were conducting this study in 2000, between the years of 2013 and 2016, um, live members really, um, you know, lauded this program as being extremely effective at um, helping them reduce chemical pressure uh, and chemical use on their vineyard and relying more on cultural practices, um, which I'll, I'll give you examples of in a minute. Um, and the live board talked about how they had evolved over time to be a lot better and, and learn and grow and how they coordinated action among dispersed organizations and their members. So, um, you know, what we saw basically was they had gotten to a point of um, being very effective at coordinating substantive action among um, for profit vineyards across these two states. Um, and we found out it was not a linear process to getting to that place at by 2016. It was actually a four stage evolution um, with quite a few uh, scares along the way. Um, you know, will this certification program and membership uh, survive, um, et cetera. So we looked at how that actually evolved. Um, and the coolest thing was, is we found that um, the standards really evolved in relation to the ecosystem disturbances that members themselves shared. Um, and that is kind of the summary of, of why we think that they're effective today. So what do I mean by disturbances, ecosystem disturbances in the context of vineyard management and farming? So uh, narrow scale, um, microscopic, you know, very narrow scale, um, such as pests, um, insects, uh, fungus, uh, fungi, fungi, and other, um, you know, local scale. Uh, and by local scale, I mean, you know, on a particular vine or a set of vines or plot of land. Um, pest pressures that vineyards face um, every day, every season. Um, 
insects you can actually see um, with your naked eye. And then also just broader scale uh, pressures like um, mold because it was a particularly rainy and damp year. Um, so that affect, you know, lots of vineyards all at once in their region. So those are what I mean by some of the um, vineyard specific pressures um, and disturbances. So here's the kind of working um, graph that graphic that we have to demonstrate the 20 year evolution of live and I'm going to walk you through it in all four stages one at a time. Um, what I do want to point out is the dashed line is the membership of live so you can see it it grows at first and then plummets and then grows and then plateaus and then grows and then plateaus so um, those are sort of the um, crisis periods that live faced um, and then we can see um, the number of pages and live guidelines that stays the same until about 2013 and then it skyrockets and um, the other issues i'll talk through um, one at a time so in this first phase um, this is when they first established they're just in oregon um, and they're having members join and the vineyard managers are coming to them left and right you know and with all these complaints about you know you have these guidelines. We think that this program is great. We don't want to spray a lot of chemicals, but we have brown apple moths, cut uh, cutworms, botrytis is an is an issue. You know the list goes on. Um, and your practices are not allowing us to combat those pests in this season, so that I can remain a viable enterprise. Because at the end of the season, I need to sell wine. I need to, I need to sell grapes. Um, and either make wine from that or sell it to somebody who will. Um, so really struggling with localized pest issues. And in part, Live realized, hey, this is because we're brand new and we did our best to, you know, account for all of these things. Um, you know, from the get-go, Live was working with extension services at Oregon State and Washington State. Um, they both have enology and viticulture programs. And, you know, they thought they had done their due diligence. And when the... Um, program was released, they had just this inundation of pests, uh, pressures that members were struggling with. And that's why we see that big dip um, in membership, because some people said, you know what, I, as much as I want to be sustainable according to live standards, I need to make money as well. Um, so we see that there's this focus on um, disturbances at a very narrow spatial temporal scale um, and they decide that they're going to use this practice of variance. So they introduce this idea that, um, okay, if, if you're a member and you want to stay certified, come to us with whatever issue you've got and we'll work with you. You know, we'll give you basically an out for that season. Um, and so, you know, the, this really comes to the fore with this vineyard manager who has said, you know, at times I do have to use synthetic chemicals I, to prevent certain problems in the vineyard. I'd pre really prefer not to have to do that, but I've got to deliver the goods and that's the way it is. Um, and, and in the same time period, you know, the board member introduces um, this idea of the variant. Um, they'll apply for a variant in order to use a pesticide when they need it. They'll discuss it with a live approved consultant, approved consultant, um, and then they've got to track it. So when they're audited in the next cycle, they can say, look, we got this variant. We um, adhered to the variant, here you go we can remain certified. Um, but then there's, you know, the members were still having a lot of um, issues. They said, you know, in a crisis, an unapproved chemical is just something you have to use. You use permission, you get permission to do it. Uh, you say, I had this, I had to use this chemical on this small little acreage because I had an infestation of leafhoppers. And you work with live to do that. And they say, you know, it's about being honest. So working within the system, LIVE is trying to basically ease the pressure while maintaining the momentum of getting this program off the ground and running. Um, and that worked for a little while. You can see the membership dashed line increase a little bit. Um, but then, um, and it grows again, 2006 is when LIVE um, in the second stage expands to Washington State. So they naturally bring more members on. However, this line is a lot flatter. The growth curve is a lot flatter than they had anticipated. Um, and what happened is, so Oregon, the, again, the reminder on the left, you have Oregon um, with its uh, wine growing regions and Washington with its wine growing regions. You have a lot of big industrial farms in Washington that have irrigation needs. 
And that was quite different from how the standard was initially formulated for Oregon vineyards, which are um, tend to be smaller on hillier slopes and don't really have any uh, needs for additional water. So um, live had these very IPM based um, rules of ecological compensation zone. These are just biodiverse areas on your property. You had to have 5% of your total land owned and operated um, as an ECA, as it was called. And also live standards had to be applied to the entire property. And the whole idea here is, yeah, to be truly sustainable and to coordinate action among members to be truly sustainable at a region level we need to have pockets of biodiversity. We need to have not just, you know, grapevines being managed this way, but also whatever else you're growing on your property, um, because that's a more systems-based response. Um, and so this is when they they realized that they get from the get-go that yes, we have two very different regions. So they actually just went ahead and made up a second set of standards for the second type of climate. Um, and these are still very quite short. They're four, four pages for region one, five pages um, for region two. This is what the guidelines look like. They have a green list. Um, that's all the cultural practices you use first. Um, and then the yellow list is um, approved chemicals. And then the red list is um, chemicals that are off limits. You can get a variant for one if you really need to. Um, so a board member says, you know, looking back, each region has a few things that are specific to that region from a technical aspect, like Southern Oregon and Eastern Oregon have less rainfall, more insect problems. Um, Willamette Valley is rainier and cool. So really looking at, you know, these broad, now they're turning their attention to these broad spatiotemporal scale issues. Oh, it's climate, climate and topography that are really shaping the differences between these two regions. So we're just gonna create different standards for these two different regions um, and thought they had it all, you know, uh, done, you know, and, and packaged up and ready to go and all the problems were solved. You know, we've got the two separate uh, standards, we have our variants, off we go. Um, well, that didn't really work. Um, <laughs> they uh, got some feedback, you know, there's a requirement this um, ECA requirement, and that set really well in that part of Oregon because of the topography. There's swells and creeks and places that weren't suitable uh, to plant vines anyway. So you just leave it and say, well, that's my set aside. That's the um, ecological compensation zone. But in the big industrial farms in Washington, they wanted to plant vines goalpost to goalpost. And so the planting created trouble to meet these requirements. So they actually had quite a bit of pushback on the standards and had trouble attracting members in Washington. And you can actually see um, that growth remained lower than they'd like and actually then um, slowed even further uh, right around 2011. Um, and so we see that in this next period, the third period, they're learning from these, you know, what they've been doing. Uh, they're, they are gaining membership, but it's not looking great. And, you know, some people who recently um, joined or leaving again. So, you know, what do we do? Um, so they ended up elaborating regional guidelines and what they did is they created these things called special protocols, which I'll talk about in a minute. So on the left here is an example of um, a special protocol. Um, on the right, they actually elaborated the standards themselves, just a little bit more to kind of put everything in one place um and help people navigate this so they worked really on clarifying the standards like we are not going to drop the eca requirement we are not going to drop the whole farm requirement but we are going to clarify for you how you can implement them in ways that um, might work for your business to remain economically viable and then special protocols um what they really did is um they started to say hey um pests move from region to region so what's common in oregon may end up in Washington if they have a really wet year or, you know, if, um, you know, Oregon has a drought one year, we might to see more things happening that would that, you know, we already have set for Washington that we should start using. So they started at the technical committee level sharing more information and special protocols would be released um, if they saw that something coming up was going to be um, a pressure. So, for instance, um, this is a quote talking about those ECA requirements getting still getting pushback uh, from Washington farmers in particular. Um, and then here's an example of kind of looking ahead and saying, hey, Oregon is facing another late harvest this year. 
Um, there's probably going to be high disease pressure for rot. So here's some stuff that we're just going to give you in advance. If that happens, it's already been approved by LIVE's uh, board. Document what you do. But instead of doing variants for individual vineyards, well, they still offered those. But in addition, if, if there was a pest pressure that was um, looked like it was going to be problematic for more than one vineyard, they would put together these pre-approved protocols that anybody could use. Um, so it relieved that um, kind of pressure one more time. Uh, one more uh, level. And then for central and southern Washington, um, you know, they're not reporting any major issues this season, but timing of the list with early season pests is an ongoing problem. And just kind of still thinking about, you know, we might think about um, looking at some of the materials that are already approved for the other region and, and bringing those in, which previews where they got to. So in the end, we can see that membership ticks up again. Um, in correlation, actually, we see that the pages in the guidelines expanded uh, quite drastically, and I'll talk about why that was important. Um, and then we also see, however, reported pest pressures, that double line uh, decreased at the same time that the guidelines and membership increased. So seemingly found a good solution um, and off they go. So one of the main things they did is they combined standards. They um, got rid of the two um, region separated guidelines and they said what will be you know these pests uh pressures are can occur in either region so we should just have everybody be prepared for um engaging in proactive preventative practices and also have a range of pre-approved um, practices to address them when they do occur um, and our technical committees in both regions are already working on these um, and working with the scientific community um, so we have all this information. It's more about putting it together in a consolidated way. So this is um, now instead of by region, they've actually created a page uh, or two for just common pests across either region. Um, and again, they did hold firm on that ECA and whole farm requirement. So they're not budging on that. Those are core principles of IPM, um, but they did expand the structure and depth of their guidelines. So really a lot of information about how to identify if a pest is appearing, a pest pressure is appearing in your vineyard, um, and then all the steps you can take um, before needing to get kind of a, a variant um, approved. So we see that at the higher level, the board is really able to see across, like how are the narrow spatial um, temporal scale practices and pest pre pre uh, pressures, you know, emerging at broader scales and then, and then back again. Um, and using technical technical committees for um, catalysts for intriguing discussions surrounding decision making in the vineyard from pest management to worker safety issues um, and really collaborating um, together now. And they're finding that, you know, different insect uh, species um, might go in the forest in the winter, come back out in the spring. And if I have this little piece and my neighbor has this little piece, um, are they using those in sync? Are we creating enough islands for biodiversity to thrive or is it getting stuck in this one little area? So they're starting to see that it's important, you know, or really more effectively seeing, I should say, the um, interconnections between uh, local vineyard practices, regional um, implications and processes. Um, and we get to the point where we have a vineyard member saying, yeah, it's a really good protocol. It's rigorous. The inspectors, they get into your files. They look at your purchases, your practices. They say, yeah, cover crops are important. If you're going to make a treatment, have a reason. If you want to irrigate, do it this way. And if you're going to use inputs that have an upstream impact and maybe a downstream in impact, have a reason for that. Does it pass the environmentalist litmus test? And so it makes you go through these series of filters and you're not just some cowboy saying, I read it in a magazine that I should do this. Um, so really this anticipatory repertoire of practices that can be implemented across regions. Um, and a live board member in 2015 summed it up well and said, you know, this is kind of the quote that sums up their bridging capacity as an organization. You know, we're not just waiting and seeing and being vulnerable, we're being prepared, we're doing this together. We feel like it's true IPM. If you're not working with a group like live, you're trying to manage all of that on your own. You may not have time, you may have to regress back to, okay, I'm just gonna spray chemicals. Um, so I'll uh, just to allow time for questions. Um, this is the model that we have working um, 
and I won't dive too much into the management um, implications that we're, we're working on, but there is a theory in management and organizational scholarship called attention focus. And um, what we're working on is how live in their bridging capacity actually does a lot of the information processing on their ecological context for individual organizations. So that for-profit member firms you see in the bottom, they can focus on their prof profitability needs. Um, they want to be sustainable, so they can work with live. And live can collect that experiential knowledge from many, many actors dispersed on the ground across these geographical regions. They can, they can collate that information over time. They can filter that experiential knowledge through the lens of scientific knowledge. Um, and then they can uh, focus their attention on different scales of different processes operating at different scales, whether it's one vineyard's issue with a pest or it's a regional issue with, with you know, something. Um, and they can identify the cross-scale interactions. And then they can curate and disseminate uh, a repertoire of practices that each individual um, vineyard and for-profit firm can implement at a narrow scale on their own vineyard plot, um, which works for the members. And the idea is that if one for-profit firm were to try and do all of this, they do not have the attentional capacity or information processing capacity to do that. And that's one of the reasons why many organizations fail um, at being really effective at sustainability. But if we have a group like Live um, and the for-profit firms are getting a benefit, they're getting their certification, they're getting their sustainability, they're getting their um, eco-label, you know, all of that stuff, Live can do the work of processing the complexity of the natural environment for them and curate and disseminate a set of practices that um, that firms can operate, but um, curated with the system and broader scale in mind. Um, so that's basically all, all I have co contributions, but um, I probably not as um, interesting as um, what you all would have to say and, and some of your questions. Um, so yes, thank you for your time. Um, I'd love to hear from you all. Thank you so much, Brooke, for such an interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, please unmute yourself or use the raise hand function or you are welcome to type your question in the chat. Clayne, you can go ahead and ask your question if you'd like. All right, thank you so much, Brooke. That was a great presentation, really interesting. A lot of things I hadn't thought about. Are you aware of voluntary standard programs for Montana agriculture besides the organic uh, voluntary programs that we're already aware of? I am not as aware. Um, I have done a little bit of searching, but not enough. I know there has been talk. I've, I've just heard of some people say we should, it would be great to have some voluntary standards programs other than organic for um, our wheat production, our um, cattle and, you know, industry, like I've heard people say they would be interested in that, um, but I haven't heard of any specific examples. I don't, maybe somebody else on the call actually might know, but um, not really, no. Yeah, okay, thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Klein. I have a question, Brooke. Um, thank you for that. I'm curious about so it's there's really great and clear evidence about how the voluntary standards program sort of evolved in terms of like what they were doing, what the standards would be and how they were adapting to this dynamic system. I'm wondering if in your interviews or other things like you learned any of the softer things about like, and, and thinking about tr the transferability of this, which I think is really important, this question of like how do bridging organizations really, um, you know, function to add resilience across different, you know, and discrete groups. Just wondering if there's anything you can comment on and kind of like the soft features of, you know, how they learn to work to be effective, um, whether that's like 
with respect to conflict management or, you know, other things that show up in this, this really interesting history. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we have a, a lot of good data that, um, I think informed our thinking, but didn't end up in the actual, um, study more directly. Um, some of the softer things were, um, this, there were a few key decision points that live experienced over time. So they kept getting pressure from their members, for instance, to be more of an eco label and to actually be a marketing organization and live the board in their, um, meeting minutes. It happened. They happened like three times where they said, we don't want to be a marketing organization, but we should think about how to do it. And then they finally came back to saying, no, we're not going to do this. We're not going to invest our limited resources in marketing. We are not going to be that. We are an education and sustainability group that has a certification as a, you know, way to attract members um, and ensure compliance. Um, but that happened three or four times and they kept getting pressured to do it, but they kept saying no. And hey, we can refer you to some marketing consultants. Um, and actually that's a fun um, fun fact. If you do buy a, a bottle of um, Oregon wine or Washington wine. Um, so for instance, Chateau Saint-Michel is live uh, certified, but they don't put it on their bottle. And, and many of the live certified groups do not. And it's because there's no marketing arm to, you know, they don't have a way to, a quick way to educate consumers about what this is and why they should care about it. Um, many of the vineyards will put B Corp label or other labels on their bottles, but not live. And um, I think that's really important because live then invested resources back into hiring environmental consultants, working with the partners at WSU and OSU. Um, and learning more about actually the functioning of their ecosystem and how to how to manage that, not how to sell more wine to consumers. Um, so that was one thing. And then another thing I think is working with those experts. They would have um, regular, um, I would say like twice a year visits from somebody at WSU or OSU, just giving a research talk, um, informing them about what are the current current research and findings in sustainable uh, viticulture and just having that lifeline be open as well be, and communication line open because if something really severe did happen, they had uh, kind of that, you know, call a friend option. Um, and they also, when they got pushed back from the Washington vineyards on that ecological compensation area, they could legitimately say, no, we talked to experts. They said we can't get rid of those. So it's not on us. They told us so. So we can't do that, which I think helped calm down the people who, you know, were upset about that. Um, you know, this is based on science. Um, so um, I think those two things are little insights that um, might be interesting. Thanks. And I guess based on that, I'll just offer one more thing, which is the last um, contribution that we think we might have is that um, an interesting thing that we see in this study is that we uh, VSP's bridging capacity might be that they can do the information processing of this scientific knowledge in tandem with the experiential knowledge. Um, so in order to really truly be sustainable and understand natural systems, we need to incorporate science. Um, which I think this audience is like, duh, but for for-profit companies, this is not something that they devote resources to on a regular basis. It's not something that um, they have time for, frankly, with the short-term profit pressures, but um, this is very important. And so one way is to, I don't know, hire a chief ecology officer and have that be a board level position and they can do that for your organization. But probably an easier thing to do and more efficient thing to do is to work with a group that does that for you and does that for everybody else. So a VSP is a really good candidate um, to be the group that is engaging with the scientific community for the rest of the firms on the ground. Um, but um, in my knowledge of eco labels and 
and VSPs, not a lot of VSPs do this, emphasize working with the scientific community, I should say. So that's um, sort of an insight that we're hoping to add to um, the VSPs themselves. Like if you would like to enact this bridging capacity, you should think about engaging with the scientific community more heavily. Do we have any more questions for Brooke? Jeff, are you raising your hand? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brooke. Um, wondering if you have any advice to small, um, I guess I would just call it collaborative efforts around the business communities who haven't started a VSP program, um, but you know, don't want to reinvent the wheel, but want to get the latest and greatest kind of best practices that you've talked about. An example is there's 150 businesses in South Park County that's talking about non-consumptive use of wildlife, for example, the whole wolf issue in, in WMU's 313 and 316. And while they're addressing, you know, the, I guess the statewide implications of quota setting, there's also a sense of responsibility to how do those businesses that make up the half a billion dollars of South Park County tourism um, participate in the problems that come with tourism. So are there like organizations that help VSPs get started? Is there a VSP of VSPs? Uh, that, that's kind of the question, sorry for the rambling. It's a good question. Um, there is not that I know of a VSP that helps other VSPs. Um, but I think um, working with or learning from, so I know that live got a few calls from other regions in the country and also other industries saying we would like to like, can you just come certify us over here? Or like, could you develop, you know, standards for us in this other industry? And live thought about it. Um, because they were having, you know, a hard time sustaining their uh, funding and they ultimately said, no, like we have enough complexity in our regional ecosystem, but here, here's our standards. We can have meetings. We can talk to you about like our philosophy. Um, and fortunately beyond that, I think it takes a couple of key people to just, um, decide they want to coordinate action and lead it. Um. Another thing that comes to mind, I don't know if this is applicable for Southern Park County um, and the issue you're describing, but, um, you know, I think about uh, extension actually here at MSU having a similar role to a VSP in terms of collating scientific knowledge and disseminating it to the community so and, and businesses. So, um, you know, I, I wonder if there's an extension specialist or agent that would um, be able to help and or identify other organizations that could help um, because that's kind of their their role as well. Um, a VSP is usually okay. organized. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we're plugged in with the extension. Um, it's just, you know, I've found the agencies and even pseudo agencies like extension, uh, they don't take a social scientific approach, right? And that's what you're talking about. And that's what I liked about this, you know, presentation is. So I was looking for, I think if I'm understanding you right, if we reached out to live and said, hey, you know, I know you're busy, give us a two hour webinar on your best practices, you know, share what documents you're willing to share. And just a framework, I mean, the startup business communities, we have that all the time. I mean, we've got plenty of models um and templates to work from but your recommendation is that they're really one of the better ones out there is what i took away 
that's what we found. And in particular, because they're so tailored to this industry. So um, yeah. that might, yeah, you try giving them a, a call and or email and see what they say. Um, and, you know, or you could email me and I'd be happy to connect you as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Go ahead, Tracy. Hi, Brooke, what a great seminar, opening my mind to many new things. Um, uh, I, I really enjoyed Jeff's insight uh, that this would be great for extension. Have you ever talked with MSU Extension or Cody Stone about, uh, you know, thinking about how to implement this model for our various initiatives in the state? No, I haven't. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't need mean to make more work for you. I just was, how do we get this word out of, of the process? So those yeah. could use it. You know, actually, as we're talking, I'm, we have other or, or examples of bridging organizations in the state, like a lot of um, natural resource-based um, nonprofits that coordinate between regions. Um, and so I wonder if we have some examples in that way. And they do work with extension um, as well. So um it might be worth the conversation for sure if there's interest thanks tracy any other questions okay well we can go ahead and wrap up thank you so much brooke for your time to present at the Rough Cut and for such a really interesting presentation. Thank you everyone for having me. Appreciated your comments and feedback. Thank you. All right.